and let's rock and roll. So today I'm going to reverse the procedure, namely to begin with, I'm going to finish the lecture from a week ago, which is about the representation theory of graphs and path algebras. And then I'm going to switch to the previous semester where I have to tell you a lot about push-outs. And because it doesn't involve any algebras or any fields, this belongs to the previous semester and I'm going to teach it to you uh, through the lecture notes, just not to lose time. All right, but for starters, let us go back to the representation theory. Uh, all I want to do right now is examples. And I came up with the following one, example. So to have an example, I first need a graph. I know, I know I'm repetitious, but I really like the Tepsis graph. And it's good enough for our purposes. So we have two edges, E and F, and two vertices, say V and W. Okay, so, so first let us define the representation. Oh, this is E of this graph. Uh, and uh, I'm going to, so first I need to, to have two vector spaces. I declare VV to be just the ground field K. And I take, well, why not? I take VW also to be the ground field K. Okay, which means that V is K plus K. And now I need to give you uh, one, two, two homomorphisms. So phi E, I declare to be identity on the vector space VV. And phi F, I define the following way. Well, it, it is, um, a map from the ground field to the ground field. So if I define it on one, I define it everywhere. Um, so it suffices if I say that phi f of one is equal to one. This defines it fully as, as a linear map, okay? And now here, I, I want to make a certain uh, remark and namely, you know, you cannot write that phi f is identity. I mean, this looks like, a, like an identity map. But remember, f goes from v to w, which means that phi f goes from v w to vv. I can declare phi e to be the identity because this is a loop. So that's all right because it goes from vv to vv. So identity is, is a map from vv to vv. But I cannot write here the identity because phi f is a map from vw to vv. And if you look at the whole vector space v, this is a map which, which, uh, which is not identity on V, right? Because remember that, that, uh, that it, has, uh, it has a kernel. I, I, I'm simply annihilating everything which is, which is uh, in uh, VW when I apply phi F. And then I, I throw things that are in, sorry, in, in VV is everything is annihilated, what is in VV. And then when, when I take anything in VW, I, I don't touch it. I just map it to uh, VV on the other side. Okay, so this is not an identity map. It's more like a flip map, All right? But of course, I, I, I hear when I write this symbol phi f, I mean it as a map from uh, the vector space, which is at the end of the edge f to the vector space which is at the beginning of, of uh, the edge f. And this is irrelevant that these two vector spaces are isomorphic. These are like two different copies. They, have, they occupy different slots in uh, the direct sum. Okay, so this yields, so now that I have it, I can claim that this yields a three-dimensional representation Of 
cos of the path algebra of our graph. Okay, maybe I'll write it on the next page. So, row of chi e is a matrix one, zero, zero, zero. Row of chi f is a matrix zero, one, zero, zero. And of course, when I take row of vertices, this gives us projections. Because remember, to, to, to a vertex, what I associate is the identity map from uh, the vector space uh, labeling labeled by this vertex to itself. Okay, so row of chi v will be the projection one, zero, zero, zero. And of course, row, when I press a button on my pen, it stops writing for a split of a second. I have to be very careful not to touch it. Okay, and now row of chi w is the other projection, zero, 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 one. Okay, and well, you, you, you see what, what happens. Um, here, in fact, uh, row of chi is the same as row of V because even though it's a loop, so I'm allowed to assign to it any homomorphism from my vector space VV to vector space VV, which is basically can be any number belonging to this tube K. Um, I just declare it to be the identity, just the same thing as we had for uh, chi V. So these are just projections. But you see, uh, uh, chi f, even though it looks like identity, it is not. This is this flip map because because uh, uh, if I take chi a uh, row of uh, chi f of say x y, what it yields is y zero. Okay. So on one hand side, it, it, it annihilates the first component and it shifts the second component up. And, and that, that's because this is this is a map which goes from uh, the vector space which occupies the second slot to the vector space which occupies the first slot. Okay, so so you see this is not a projection. This is not an identity map. I mean, just some sort of projection with permutation, if you want. Okay, good. And of course, this is a uh, three dimensional because uh, now. Yeah, I, 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 you, you, you see that, that you have uh, uh, all slots of this two by two matrix occupied except for the left bottom, okay? And observe that this is very much in line with what we studied before. Do you remember there was a proposition that if my uh, graph uh, is finite and admits only loops of vertex length one, okay? So there are only short loops, edge loops. There are no loops sort of longer than, ah, sorry, yes, that's the same story. There are, there are longer loops, but they have just one vertex. I can wind around as many times as I want. But, but, but if there are loops, they are uh, of vertex length at one. Uh, then we have this upper triangular presentation of this path algebra. And you see this representation is very much in line with it. So this is, in line, it's nice when mathematics is consistent. Oops, I don't want to change color. Yeah, because the upper triangle presentation for this particular graph is you have polynomials here. You have, of course, zero here, just the field over here. Again, I, I'm having problems writing because I pressed some button. Oh. What's going on? I cannot write. Am 
my pen just stopped working. Ah, because I unscrewed the battery, I suppose. Wait, it still doesn't work. Darn. Okay, I, I suppose I have to switch to uh, the lecture notes and I'm going to do it soon anyway, because right now my pen just stopped working. And I think that playing with changing battery would take too long. So allow me to go now to the lecture notes. Ay, 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 this is really annoying. So I share screen and I share this one. Okay, where is Dropbox? Here it is. We are almost there. So you see, this is this upper triangle uh, proposition, okay? And when you look at this particular case, uh, then, then this is two by two matrix because you have only two vertices. And um, when you look, uh, here, because the only path starting at, at uh, the second vertex is this vertex itself. So this is, here we have just a few. And when I look over here, uh, well, this is a vertex which emits one loop. So the only path will be uh, these loops, uh, which just are given by the winding number. They will always be a vertex in one. And you can compose this edge you will self as many times as you want. So this will give rise to the polynomial algebra. And here will, you'll again have this polynomial algebra in one variable. However, here it will not be treated as an algebra, but as a module, as a module which is left over the polynomial ring and right over the field. This is a bimodule like this. Okay, but I will now find it here. Yes, you see. So that's uh, this is where my pen stopped working. Okay. So as I said here, Kn in the right upper corner is viewed as a bimodule rather than a ring. Because in order to make this matrix into an algebra, the only structure that we need at this object in the upper right corner is that it is a bimodule. Bimodule of the ring, which is up there on the diagonal and on, on the left. And, and uh, on the right, it has to be a module of uh, the ring, which is down on the diagonal. Okay, so that's, that's the same structure, but, but if you want, we have like this additional variable and, and you know what it is. I mean, here we are talking about paths from uh, E to F, okay, see the diagram. And uh, uh, all paths from E to F are labeled by first you wind around as many times as you want via E, maybe zero times, and then you go by F from V to W. Okay, so that's, this is this is sort of uh, like this polynomial ring, but treated as a as a module, a bimodule. Okay, so you see this is very much in line because what I got here is also upper triangular, except that here it's three dimensional. Uh, it's as if I chose here only the polynomials of degree zero, and then I have three fields, and this is my representation. So this is very much in line uh, with what we had before. But now we see uh, obviously. Uh, this representation is not faithful because the algebra is infinite dimensional, 
simply because it has a loop. I mean, anyway, you see it here from this presentation. And uh, the representation is three dimensional, right? So, so obviously it cannot be faithful. By the way, the dimension of the representation is not the dimension of the vector space, which is the carrier of a representation. Now remember, representation is a map from an algebra to endomorphism ring or endomorphism algebra of a vector space. So yes, you can take this vector space to be as infinite dimensional as you want, but if your representation is the zero map, that's not an infinite dimensional representation. The, the dimension of representation is the dimension of its image. Okay, and here the dimension of, of the image is obviously three dimensional because here you see the spanning vectors. Okay, so now there is a natural question, which is not very difficult. Uh, it's sort of tautological consideration, but I, I decided to put it in anyway. Uh, how can we get in a canonical manner a faithful representation of uh, the path algebra? Okay, so in a way, now I'm doing in full generality without assuming that my graph is finite, without assuming that uh, there are no loops of vertex, vertex length bigger than one, just an arbitrary graph. How can I represent it? Okay, and well, I can represent it using this terminology of graph representation, and this is a faithful representation, so you can see it as, as, as embedded inside. This is very much like less regular representations. For, for these of you who work with quantum groups, this is kind of obvious, right? Because I, I take as my carrier vector space just the path algebra itself. This is my vector space, and, and uh, I use it as the carrier vector space of, of representation of, of KE, and I prove it is faithful. So if you have, I don't know, a locally uh, compact house of group, uh, then you take the, the, the Hilbert space of L2 functions on, on G, and, and, and then by shift you define the representation of a group, and then you can extend it the representation of a group ring or, or the convolution sister algebra. So this is very much in this spirit. It's kind of tautological, but it's still useful. Okay, so how do I uh, really define it? So this is what we are discussing right now. Um, so first I have to tell you what are my vector spaces labeled by vertices. And I take simply the vector space spanned by paths which start, which begin in a given vertex. So this is what is written here, chi V times the path algebra Ke. This is, a, this is a vector space spanned by chi's labeled by paths that start at V, okay? And then what are um, these um, homomorphisms labeled by edges? Well, here I have a definition. So phi E obviously goes from chi T E, K E, to chi S E, K E, Right, because this is the vector space assigned to a given vertex. And what's the definition? I take a basis element chi p. So p is a path starting at, at uh, te, okay? And I map it to phi e of chi p, obviously, which is defined as chi e p. So I just uh, adjoin it from the left, which I suppose uh, makes sense because, because, because uh, the, end, uh, the end of E must be the beginning of P, right? We, we just, yeah, we, this is what, I, what we said. The P begins at the end of E, okay? So this concatenates, all right, EP is a path. And of course, this is a path which begins where? It begins at the same vertex where E begins. So this belongs to the vector space chi S E of KE. So this is all well defined. This follows uh, our procedure of constructing a graph representation. And now we can prove that indeed the thus defined graph representation yields the representation of the path algebra, which is faithful. Okay, so first let's see what kind of representation it is. Well, this is basically, this is simply given by, by the left multiplication on Ke. So not, not a big deal. I take uh, chi q, I map it to rho of chi q, which is an endomorphism of the K of E. And, and you see that uh, if you follow the procedure 
of how you induce a representation of a path algebra from a representation of its graph. Well, then, then this will be a draw of chi q on chi p is just chi p. Okay. And, and, and uh, you, you see how it works uh, because here this is just given by concatenation, right? So, so that's, uh, that's clear where you get this formula from. And, and of course, when q and p dot concatenate, you have zero. Right, so, so, so here, if, if you take a chi p, which is not from this vector space, but from other part of my representation. Ah, well, I should also mention that, of course, when I take the direct summons of all these vector spaces, I have the whole ke. Because every, every, every path starts somewhere, and uh, these sets of paths starting at different vertices form these joint sets. So when you linearize it, you'll have different direct summons. And so then you can take the really the direct sum of all these vector spaces, and this will give you immediately the, the, the path algebra K. I hope it's obvious. Are there any questions? I didn't write it down, but, but I, I, I somehow assumed that it would be obvious. If I take the direct sum of, of these vector spaces over all vertices, I'll simply get K. K. And, and uh, we know what happens when Q and P concatenate. That comes from this formula. And when they don't concatenate, well, then obviously by the definition of a row, uh, we get zero. And also we get zero here on the right hand side when Q and P don't concatenate by the definition of multiplication of power function. So if you want here, we work backwards. We wanted to see. Uh, the obvious left multiplication representation of, of, of algebra on itself. And uh, we unravel that it comes from this graph representation. But what is maybe more interesting is to see that this is indeed faithful. That's not true, I suppose, for all algebras. It's not always, but when you, when you take, uh, when you represent an algebra as left multiplier of itself, that is going to be faithful. You, you might have some zero devices and stuff like that. I mean, here I have zero devices as well. Anyway, it, it, I don't believe this is always the case, but we can prove that this is the case here. And I think that this is because we have approximate unit. The approximate unit, if I remember correctly, in a non unital algebra, um, is, is simply the, the, the property that, uh, yes, there is no one element which is really the unit in the algebra, it need not exist. But for every element X in your algebra, there exists another element such that this element times the other one, whichever side is going to be equal to the element you started from. So there's some X times one X equals to X and one X times X equals to X, but you have to change this one as you change X. It, it's sort of when, when you think, I don't know, of finitely supported functions, there is no one, okay? But whichever finite supported function you take, then you take simply the support of this function, put one everywhere else, and this will act as a unit for this finite support function. Okay, so now let's check that this is really faithful. Um, so I'm taking, a, but now I cannot just uh, work with the basis element. I have to take an arbitrary element. So I choose a finite subset F of uh, FPE. So a finite set of finite paths. Uh, I use the running index Q. I use arbitrary coefficients alpha Q, and this is my general element in the path algebra. I apply row to it, and I want to prove that if, if uh, uh, th this is zero, then the element I started uh, with was zero. And since I assume that row of this element is zero, it must be zero when I apply it to any vector. Remember, this is a presentation. So this is an, in, in the endomorphism ring. So I can apply it to any vector. But my vector space is Ke. So a vector in my vector space is, is just an element in my path algebra. And here I, I do something, I do the following. Since the set F is finite, the set of all endpoints of paths in the set is also finite. So I can take a sum over it. So I take all vertices, which are endpoints of paths in F. And then I assign to these uh, vertices projections, chi v, and I sum it up. And you see that, that when, I, when I do it, the, the result of applying this representation 
uh, will be uh, just the sum over F alpha Q chi Q. Why? Because uh, chi V uh, will annihilate all chi Qs which, uh, where, where Q doesn't end at, at, at V, okay? There will be always at least one Q uh, which really ends at V and, and then chi V times this uh, summon will be, uh, will make the summon unchanged. And voila, here it goes. So chi V acting on any element here in the summon I either yields zero or it yields the summon. So it, 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 it doesn't change it. So the, the result will be uh, the sum as we had it before. Okay, and, and if this is, this is equal uh, to zero, well, then that is exactly what we wanted to prove, injectivity of rho, right? <laughs> I, I just hope that this is clear why this this, this last uh, last equality. Um, yeah, I, let, let's let's uh, take any kind of one by one, right? We 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 have this distributivity of um, multiplication over addition. So so I take I, I fix my v, and I multiply it uh, over here. And, and, and what it will do? It will um, simply select all these summons labeled by Qs which end at V and annihilate all others. Now, when I take another V, then this will obviously annihilate these uh, summons which are already taken because they, they end somewhere else. Right now I take W different than V. And again, I select all uh summons with q's ending in my vertex so if you want i'm i'm just um, uh, splitting this sum over f into sub sums uh where i have um, q's ending in a given vertex i can have more than one uh q ending in a given vertex okay so i i split this sum into finite sub summons and and then what this chi v does is, is simply each chi v selects its own sub summon and, and when you sum it up over all chi v's, you will get everything. Now my pen is gone, so I cannot, I cannot write it. Uh, but I hope it's clear. If you have any question, just say it. Okay. So now that's all I wanted to tell you about this uh, representation theory of um, path algebras. Um, this is just the tip of an iceberg. Uh, this is what people really, really study in, in, in algebra in, in representation theory and classification of, of uh, algebras. But this is not the path we're going to take. So I just wanted you to be aware because I find it particularly cute and, and promising. You can really, really cook up some nice representations out of this uh, paradigm. Um, but that's not what we're going to study. So I think that's enough. So it's just like a sneak preview. Uh, a peek, you know, through the window onto the route we are not going to take. And now we go back to the previous semester. You see, this is why I decided not to change battery in my pen because I had very little to finish. It would take more time for me to change the battery. And now we are going to dive into the theory of pushouts. And today we start our recitation class with Niklas and the solution of this pushout problem. I know, I know this was defined in the previous semester, but now this is a formal definition, which I give to you of a pushout in any category. This is very elementary, not a big deal, but somehow you have to get friendly with it, familiarize yourself. So I take some category C. I couldn't find any assumptions on Wikipedia. Okay, a pushout might exist or might not exist, but uh, just to formulate the definition, I don't need any assumptions about my category. <laughs> so I have some objects X, Y, Z in my category C and I have morphisms. So I take F to be a morphism from Z to X and I take G to be a morphism from Z to Y, right? So to find the pushout, I must have a pair of morphisms with the same domain. Yeah, that's, that's the essence, okay? Now the pushout of these two morphisms is an object P, of course, in the same category C, together with morphisms IX and IY, where IX goes from X to P and IY goes from Y to P, 
and such that they render the diagram commutative. And that's not it. That's this, this just first property. And the crucial property is that they, they satisfy the universal property, which is the following. If I have some other object Q, if I had a pen, I would draw it. Maybe I can still draw with uh, annotate. Let me see. Yes, draw. Okay. Yeah, I'll do it with a mouse. Yeah, that's actually cool. Imagine that I, I take um, some other object Q. Sorry, I did it in the wrong order. Which has the following property. There are some morphisms here from X and from Y. I call them JX and JY. And they have this property that they equalize F and G. So in other words, uh, JX composed with F is the same as JY composed with G. If such a situation happens that there is another object and there is a pair of morphisms which behaves as if it were a push out, then there exists a unique morphism H here, and this uniqueness is important, which has the following property. It, it, it renders these two triangle commutative. Yeah? So there exists a unique morphism H from P to Q, such that JX is the same as the composition of IX and H, and JY is the same as the composition of IY and or IOTA Y and H. Okay. So we just recall the definition of a pullback in, in an arbitrary category. Okay, now we can go down, but I'm afraid I have to erase my beautiful picture because it will always stay at the same part of the screen. <laughs> when I scroll down, I'll always have this picture. So that's a bit disturbing. Okay. Now I don't want to annotate anymore, so I kill it. Yes, and delete the highlight. So that's the definition of the Merle general definition of a push-up. This is the definition Niklas is going to use today. <laughs> now, but in the category of sets, uh, we know it very well. If I have two maps, I have a set Z, set X, and set Y, and I have a map from Z to X and from Z to Y, then what is the push out? Well, I simply take the disjoint sum of my two spaces, two sets X and Y, and I divide it by the, the equivalence relation, which is the minimal equivalence relation generated uh, by uh, F by the pair FZ and GZ for N Z in Z. And IX and IY are the obvious maps. Well, they are obvious because you obviously have, have an inclusion of X in the disjoint union of X with Y, the same goes for Y, and then you apply the canonical quotient map. So this is why I call IX and IY the obvious maps. And if you are wondering whether the definition of the equivalence relation as the minimal equivalence relation generated by makes sense, think about the following. Uh, I take, uh, what is a relation? Relation is, is a subset in uh, the Cartesian square and uh, satisfying some properties, okay? And, and now I can look at all equivalence relations which contain my relation and then I can take the intersection. Okay. So what you really what you really have to see is that uh, there always exists at least one equivalence relation which contains any relation, and of course there exists the whole Cartesian product. When you identify everything, everything this is an equivalence relation. Okay, so there exists always one equivalence relation which contains any relation, and then you have to convince yourself that uh, when you intersect equivalence relations, this will be intersection will be an equivalence relation. But that's an uh, elementary set of theory. Right? You just have to remember the defining properties. I mean, one of them is, for instance, that the diagonal is included. Well, if you inter intersect subsets which all include diagonal, then diagonal will be in the intersection, and so on and so forth. And you have the symmetry and transitivity. You have to write it down and check it. But the intersection of equivalence relations is the equivalence relation. So such a thing exists. Okay. Uh, well, maybe I'll give it as an exercise to give a full proof of it. 
Okay, so that's the push out in the category of sets and maps. And this we proved in the previous semester. This is one of the exercises. So I'm not going to repeat it. This is so well known, I'm not going to repeat it or give a reference. But now we are wondering what this will be in the category of graphs and graph homomorphisms, okay? And this is what we are going to study today at length. So I take my category of G where objects are graphs and uh, morphisms are graph homomorphisms. So remember this pair with uh, satisfying the compatibility condition with the source and target maps. And uh, so first I was going just to define uh, the push out graph of any two graph homomorphism with the same domain. And then uh, Niklas during the recitation class is going to prove that it yields a push out in the just recalled categorical sets. But first I want to define the push out graph, which is a lot of fun because you, you can chase the diagrams. I was so happy that that I had it ready in LaTeX in one of my papers because doing such fancy diagrams is a lot of work. And I have to apologize for arrows going sort of in, in the wrong direction. I, I, I prefer the convention when, when I study pushouts in this way, that sort of whether it's pushout or pullback, the object I'm defining is at the top. And for pushout, I have arrows going up and for pullbacks, I have arrows going down. But I didn't dare to reverse arrows here. This looks too complicated. So, so what I simply did, I flipped the diagram. So now my push out is at the bottom and my defining morphisms are at the top. So I apologize for the inconsistency. I'll ask my co-author Marius to, to, to change it in LaTeX, but uh, I didn't want to waste my night uh, doing a LaTeX exercise. Okay, so uh, first, if I look at the set, so I have, I have, I have these uh, three graphs and I have two morphisms. I have a morphism from G to E and a morphism from G to F. But in particular, uh, what does it mean? It means that I have a map from G1 to E1, which is F1. I have a map from G1 to F1, which is G1. I have a map from G0 to E0, which is F0. And I have a map from G0 to F0, which is G0. So, 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 so this uh, gives me um, which arrows? Uh, yeah, so, 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 so these, these are these four arrows, F1, G1, F0, G0, which are simply given to me uh, because I have a morphism of graphs, okay? And now I'm in the category of sets and maps, so nobody can stop me from constructing the pullback of these pairs of morphisms. So here I have a pullback of edges and here I have a pullbacks of vertices. These are pullbacks in the category of sets just as defined above, okay? So, so this also includes these obvious maps which I labeled by the subspaces. Okay, so it's IOTA and then the subspace which I map into the push up. Okay, so, so that's uh, the, these um, squares left and right, they're commutative by the definition of a push up. The maps I, IOTA with labels are defined in such a way that these diagrams are committed. But that's not the end of the story. Uh, of course, I have two diagrams because I have the same diagram for the target map as I have for the source map, okay? Because now, look, I have SG, which is the source map in G going from G1 to G0. I have SE, which is the source map going from E1 to E0, and I have SF which is the source map going from F1 to F0. And likewise with the target maps, okay? Exactly the same story. The only difference between these two diagrams is that I switch S into F, into T, okay? And now by the very definition of what a graph homomorphism is, uh, we conclude that the top rectangles or top squares, whatever you want to, topological squares, uh, you want to call them are commutative because the commutativity means that if I go first by F1 from G1 to E1, and then I apply the source map from E1 to E0, this is the same as applying first the source map as G from G1 to G0, and then the map F0 from G0 to E0. You see, so the, the commutativity uh, of these two top diagrams is guaranteed by the definition of a homomorphism, of a graph homomorphism, okay? So I have these left and uh, right squares with morphisms going down commutative. 
and I have these uh, two top squares with pairs of morphs going left to right, also commutative. And now I claim that this induces, uh, by the universal property of, of a pushout, this induces a map which I labeled as disjoint union or coproduct uh, from the pushout of ver uh, edges to the pushout of vertices. And of course, the same for the target diagram. So this is what I just said, that the 11th are commit by definition and the top of the definition of a homomorphism, right? So this has been discussed. But now there is a little tiny computation which we want to make. Come on, I want to highlight all of this. <laughs> Namely, uh, I, I have that, 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 that these uh, S this joint union and this joint union are defined by the universal property of the push out of edges. So in order to, to, to use the universal property, recall what it is. That's this beautiful property. Okay. I first must find maps j1 and, and jx which equalize f and g all right so i have to define these maps jx and j1 in, in in the diagram so my map if you want j e1 this is the map which i get by going by se from e1 to e0 and then by iota e0 from e0 to the push out of uh of vertices so this is my my jx if you want. Now my jy is constructed much in the same way. First I go by sf from f1 to f0 and then I go by iota f0 from f0 to the push out of the vertices. Okay so these are these are my jx and jy and I have to prove that that they equalize f1 and g1 and this is what this calculation is is all about. Okay, so iota E0 composed with SE is my JX, I, I composed with F1. Then iota E0 uh, is composed with F0 SG. This is, uh, sorry, no, 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 sorry. This, uh, now I just compute, I just compute. So, 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 so I want to prove that I have this equalization property. So I start with, uh, uh, if you want, iota E0 JX, yeah, where SEF1 is my JX. Okay, and now I use uh, the already established commutativity which I have in the diagram. So what is SE uh, composed with F1? Well, so maybe it's good to, to, to see the, this path. I go by F1 here, then I go by SE there, and when I go by iota E0, okay? But now I use the commutativity in, in the top diagram. So this is the same as going by, uh, okay. And I, and I do it, this is the same calculation because uh, it goes without saying that this is completely identical for source and the target maps. I already said that, that these two diagrams differ only in these two letters, right? One, one is S with indices, another one is T with indices. So in fact, let me look at the, the second line which is the calculation for, for the target diagram. And it's identical to the calculation for the source diagram. It's just easier for me to, to repeat these two graphs and these two calculations rather than um, introducing some alien notation, new notation with, I know, indices one and two changing and so on and so forth. Uh, okay, so it's maybe it's a bit clumsy, but at least it's conspicuously clear what, what I mean. So let me now, let, so let, let's just check this second line and this is identical procedure as for checking the, the first line. And I'm doing it because the diagram is not visible. Okay, so one more time. I go uh, by F1 from G1 to E1, then I go by TE from E1 to E0, and then, then I go by IE0 from E0 to the push out E0, F0 over G0. So this is this zigzag. But now use the commutativity at the, at the top. So I replace it by going first uh, from G1 to G0 by TG and by F0 from G0 to E0. And then I still go by uh, IE0. But now we see 
the last part is just F0 and I is zero. And now here's the commutativity of the right square. And I replace F0, I is zero by G0, I F0. So that's, that's exactly what I, what I wrote here, right? I, I just replaced I is zero, F0 by I, F, uh, by, I, by, I, by I F0, G0, okay? Okay, so now this is my path. I go right and I go down on the right bank, okay? But now, I, but now I can use the commutativity of the other top diagram and I can replace TG G0 by G1 uh, TF, yeah? So instead of having TG G0, I, I'm, I'm putting in G1 TF and here we go. This is G1 and TF. And now I'm, I'm done because uh, I, I, I have this equalization, um, which I needed. I have that, that uh, uh, I is zero of, of uh, that I is zero of TE F1 is the same as I F zero of uh, TF G1. Yeah, let's see that, that this is, uh, Yeah, that, that's a property I wanted. I needed. I, I have my my uh, my maps uh, j x and j y that equalize for me uh, the maps f and g. So here the maps f and g are f one and g one. So this is what I equalize equalize f one and g one. Okay, and and I told you that my j x and j y are played by uh, on one hand side this is t e and i e zero, and on the other side is uh, um, uh, TF and IF0. And this is what I just proved. Okay, so the assumption of the universal property is satisfied. I, I indeed constructed the equalizing modes in JX and JY. So I can now claim the benefit given to me by the universal property. I know that there exists a unique morphism from P to Q, and my P is, of course, the, the, the push out of edges. And my Q is the push out of vertices. So this is my P and this is my Q, uh, which has the following property. Now it, it equalizes, well, it, it, it makes um, the, the, the bottom diagrams commutative, right? Because when I look at this property, I know that my JX, and remember that JX is SEIE0, is the same as IE1 and this map H. So this means that the left bottom square is commutative. And when I look at the second uh, property that J, JY, oops, oh, this should be a, an uppercase. Sorry, there is a typo. I have to correct it. And JY is just this unique uh, map from P to Q composed with IY. Okay, so now my, my JY is uh, SF IF0. Okay, and, and, and this, is, this is the same as having IF1 and this universal map over here. Okay, so this gives me the commutativity of the right bottom square. Maybe it would be helpful. <laughs> yeah, I can annotate. Let me see, how can I annotate? Uh, where is this? Yes, annotate. Okay. Oh, la, la. Now, before annotating, I have to put it at the right place because I can either scroll or annotate. Okay. So let's, yeah, that's exactly what we want to see. Now, again, okay, annotate. Yes, yeah, good to annotate. Okay, so this is my P. This is my Q. And this is my H. Okay. So uh, this is my
jx. I mean, x is e1, okay? And maybe it has a different color. And this is my j y. So, so what we did uh, was first uh, we proved the equalizing property. So I composed uh, F1 with Jx and I composed G1 with Jy and I proved that they agree. That's the calculation at the bottom and the identical calculation is for the source diagram. So now I could apply the universal property. There exists a unique map from the pushout here of, of edges to this Q, which is over there, which happens to be the push of the vertices. And this map H has the property that it um, equalizes uh, IE1 and IF1. I mean, uh, sorry, no, 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 sorry. I, 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 I said something stupid. It, it gives me, it, it factorizes JX and JY via the push of P. So, so Jx and Jy factorize via the, 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 the push out. So in, in other words, Jx is the same as um, IE1 and H. And Jy is the same as IF1 and H. But these are precisely the two bottom lines. It, it, it's, it's kind of funny because you see, I'm not using the specific nature of the push out in the category of sets. Yeah, I defined it in a constructive manner. So I could just use pure set theory and, and, and look at elements and maps and see how it works. But, but I find this categorical way of, of chasing diagrams much more appealing. Yeah, so, so I'm just uh, using that we have proved that this construction is really the push out in the category of, uh, of sets and maps, okay? Any questions here? Okay, if not, let me, uh, there is some clear old drawings, look, it's gone. Now I kill the annotate and I can still scroll. All right, so now uh, having established all this, uh, we are really ready to, define the push-out graph. And that's the definition which Niklas is going to use in his proposition. So you see the proposition below is for the recitation task. Oh, oops, I wanted to just highlight it. And yes, here it is. So without any surprise, uh, I, I, I define um, the set of vertices to be the, the push-out set of vertices, the set of edges to be the push-out set of edges. And I just proved that there exists maps S disjoint and T disjoint, which go from the push-out of edges into the push-out of vertices. That will be just proved by all these considerations above, right? So, so this diagram is well-defined. This is really, a, 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 sorry, this graph is well-defined. This is really a graph. And so this means that these maps are maps from uh, with edges being the domain and, and vertices being the target um, of both maps, source and target maps. Uh, and now we call it the push out uh, graph of these two graph homomorphisms, of course, with the same domain. Okay. So this is a construction. But now uh, it would be kind of disappointing if this con explicit construction wouldn't agree with a categorical definition. So here comes the proposition for the recitation class. Yeah, I take this uh, EGF to be the push out graph of two graph homomorphisms. And then the claim is that when I take uh, and bundle up into pairs, these canonical maps, iota E0, iota E1, iota F0 and iota F1, which are given to us in the category of sets, I bundle them up together. I claim that these pairs 
give me a graph homomorphism, this has to be defined, this has to be verified. And uh, uh, they, they, they render the pushout diagram, uh, a pushout in the category of G of graphs and graph homomorphisms. So first, these two guys really are graph homomorphisms. Mm -hmm. And secondly, they have they enjoy the universal property, but that's to be proven in the recitation class. Okay. Any questions? All right. Our next stop is to see a specific case of a pushout, which we already study in quite at length in the previous semester. Uh, namely, what happens when G is simply the intersection graph EF and these graph homomorphisms are simply inclusions of, of a graph G as a subgraph of E and as a subgraph of F, right? When, when G is the intersection graph, I can view the intersection uh, graph as a subgraph of both graphs which I intersect. And these are my graph homomorphisms, okay? Injective, they are just inclusions. And then you can convince yourself very easily then then the pushout graph for this pair of homomorphisms with the same domain is indeed simply the union graph. And how do we see it? Well, first by definition, uh, oops, and again, here's a typo. Here should be not G1 by GI. So the second typo is there. Um, well, they are just uh, self theoretical unions. Well, why? Because uh, they, this is what we know in the category of sets. We know in the category of sets that when we uh, have the pushout uh, given by the inclusion of the intersection subset in uh, the two subsets that we intersect, the pushout is exactly the self theoretical union that we know from the category of sets. So this is this is uh, the, the source of these identities, which are true both for the pushout of edges and the pushout of vertices. So now you still have to convince yourself that indeed uh, uh, the, the maps uh, which are defined by the universal property are precisely the maps that we defined meticulously um, in the previous semester, uh, the, 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 the union, uh, the, the source map for the union graph and uh, the target map for the union graph, that, that they agree. Okay, but uh, they do agree because remember what we just established that the universal property renders these two bottom diagrams commutative, okay? So if you look at whatever source or the target map, this is an identical situation, then look what it means when uh, G1 is just the intersection of E1 and F1 and G0 is just the intersection of E0 and F0. So that's the situation uh, we're going to consider. Maybe it would be useful to annotate, but I cannot find this bar for annotation. Come on, where is it? Now, this is so strange. I want the bar for annotation. And it's gone. Well, today it, 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 it's the second technical problem. First, my pen died. And, and, and now, even though I did it a number of times before, I cannot go to this annotate. Ah, I don't understand why, why did it? Okay, annotate. Good, yes. So now we are looking at the situation when, when G1 is E1 intersect F1 and G0 is E0 intersect F0. And these are just the inclusion maps, okay? Well, then obviously what, what I have here is, is nothing but the set union. And 
and likewise on the right for vertices. This is just the set union of E0 and F0. So I'm writing all of this so that it's clear what are these canonical maps. They are just inclusions of, of diagrams into the union diagram, the set into the union of sets. So E1 is the inclusion. So these are also the inclusion maps, okay? That's the inclusion of E1 in the union of E1 and F1, and also here, and also there, and also there. <laughs> so now we can really check of what these maps given by the universal property are. Well, I, I know that the bottom diagrams are commutative. So if I take anything in the union, this is either from E1 or from F1. If it is from E1, well, this, is, this, this comes this way. But by the commutativity is the same as simply taking the, 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 the target uh, in the subgraph E, mapping it into E0, and then including E0 into the union. So that's exactly how we defined uh, T cup uh, for any edge coming from one of the sets of which I take the union. And, and likewise, if I, if I take if my edges from F1, well, uh, then, then, then what does it mean that I apply to this, this universal T pi? Well, this is the same as, as having this composition now going from F1 uh, to the union and then by T pi. But, but the commutativity is the same as, as having now um, uh, the, the, the target map in the graph F applied to this edge in the graph F. I get a vertex in the graph F and I include it in the spherical union. So this is precisely uh, the definition of uh, T cup. Yeah, it sounds nice, T cup. <laughs> It makes me feel like having a cup of tea um, uh, that we defined earlier. And I can actually even prove it to you because I'm using the lecture notes. I can scroll back. Yeah, and I have to, one of the things, you see, this is what happens with this annotate. Uh, uh, where, where is it? Annotate, stop. No, 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 no. Oof. Annotate, clear all joints. Okay, now it's gone, now it's good. I want to go back, show you how we defined it. Sorry, I don't remember the page. Oops, I didn't, what, what happened? I don't want it. What is this page? Oh my goodness. I better start it again because I incidentally clicked on something and um, It's not doing what I want it to do. Yeah, so here we have subgraphs. Yeah, the intersection graph and the union graph. You see, that's the definition of, of, of a T cap. That's precisely what happens for this T uh, disjoint union, T co product. And, and, and we checked it for the target map, but of course it's identical for the source map, yeah? So, so this really checks out. Um, so we just proved that indeed, when my graph homomorphisms are just inclusions of the intersection graph, then the push out of such a pair of homomorphisms given by inclusions of a subgraph, which is an intersection graph, is nothing by, by the union graph. Okay, because everything checks out the, the set of edges, the set of vertices, and the source and target maps. We have just equalities on the nodes. But it, it requires you know, some verifications. Okay. 
Now uh, I, I realize, and I apologize that this was so elementary and so boring, but somehow um, you don't save much time by skipping such things because you have to fix notation. You have to uh, fix, uh, you have to be on the same page with what you mean by what you, you, you introduce some terminology and so on and so forth. So, so I apologize for such, you know, completely trivial arguments and, and, and remarks. But uh, I think the chasing diagrams is fun. And now finally we get to something non-trivial, something which surprised me a little bit, okay? Um, so this is like a prelude to, 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 to things that are interesting and, and useful. It's, it's establishing the language we are speaking. Uh, look, we here just considered only the graph homomorphism, but what about path homomorphisms of graphs, okay? Well, when you think about path homomorphisms of graphs, since they immediately give you maps from the spaces uh, between the spaces of finite paths in a graph, you can simply take the push out in the category of sets and maps. Okay? Nobody can stop you from considering such push outs, whether or not F or G come from graph homomorphisms. Whenever you have a path graph homomorphism, then you have the induced maps. From, from between uh, finite spaces of, uh, between spaces of finite paths. And you just take the push out in the category of sets and maps, okay? But this leads to a very interesting, and as it turned out, non-trivial question, under which conditions you can claim that the push out of the spaces of paths is the same as the set pace of paths of the push -up. I I must admit that for starters, I naively thought that they would be always equal, but this is completely wrong. And you can construct very simple counterexamples. So I sat down together with Marius, my former PhD student, and we solved this puzzle. We, we have the answer to this question. And the answer to this question is the following. And this is where I plan to stop the lecture. Yes, it was the time because I didn't take my watch. Seven minutes before 11. Yes, okay. So, so this, this was um, uh, done a, a bit faster than I expected. Mm, I will make it up the next time, but... Um, uh, I, I don't have the proof typed up and uh, uh, I can just, and I cannot write because my pen is gone. The only thing I can try is to resurrect my pen, um, but let's first see the answer to this question, okay? And the answer is very interesting in my opinion and definitely it was not expected. Um, so now we take a pair of graph homomorphisms with the same domain but we pose certain demands. They're not arbitrary pairs of graph homomorphism with the same domain. We first demand that both F0 and G0 are injective. And let me call this condition vertex injectivity condition. Secondly, I want to have the following property that if I take the target map in the pushout graph, because you see, now I have these two constructions. I have a set, which is the push out of uh, the spaces of finite paths, okay? And now I have the space of finite paths of the push out. So this is, if you want, the question of when the functor FP commutes with the push out construction. Um, so in particular, I have this graph here, the push out graph, e e EFG. So, so I, I want, I will demand the following property that when I take the end in the push-out graph of some edge X, and it is equal to the beginning in the push-out graph of some edge Y, if I have such concatenation property that I can concatenate X and Y, that it means that both X and Y are in the image of E1 included canonically into the, 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 the edges of the push-out graph, 
or I have at both X and Y, I in the image of IOTA F1, including F1 canonically into the space of edges in the pushup graph. So I call, call it the one color property. So if you, if you think of, of edges from E as red and edges from F as green, I have the following property. And when I look at this push out graph and I can concatenate X and Y, that either both of them are green or both of them are red. Of course, it might happen. Remember, there's a non-trivial intersection. Of course, it might happen that say you have an edge which is both green and red. That's not mutually exclusive. But 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 what I do not allow is the situation in which one edge is only red and the other edge is only green, and they concatenate. That's not allowed. Okay. If one of them is, for instance, two colors, that's okay. Then then the color of the other edge is irrelevant. Yeah, because we'll have a matching of edges. And, and this is subsumed in, in this uh, uh, condition here, which for obvious reasons, I call the one color condition. And you must admit that this is a little bit surprising. I mean, when you think about it, it's natural, even obvious, but uh, that's, uh, that's something that comes out when you try to prove such a statement, right? You try to prove that you have such an equality and then you see, wait a second. Uh, first, indeed, I have a natural map uh, from this push out into this set. And uh, well, you have to prove it that it's well defined, but but you have it. And the claim is of the lemma that this is well defined and budget. So I realized these conditions when I tried to uh, construct the inverse of. Um, of this natural map and uh, all that I, I want to uh, tell you right now is just uh, let me see I forgot my watch on the top of it so I have to dig out my smartphone to see the time yes it's 10 10 58 okay so just just so so today's lecture will be 15 minutes shorter but i will make it then 15 minutes longer next time um unless unless uh yeah i have an idea what what we can you know what we can continue with we can continue with nicholas proving his the proposition it will be good part of a lecture uh, but let me first still take these two minutes and and um, uh, try to 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 finish uh, the outline of the proof so first, uh, note that it is part of this proposition to be proven is that we have graph homomorphisms of graphs into the push out graph. Okay. So, so that's to be proven, but let's assume that's done. And remember, FP is a functor. So because FP is a functor and we have a graph homomorphism from E to the pushout graph if and G, and we have a graph homomorphism from F into the pushout graph if EFG, then of course, because FP is a covariant functor, then we have a map, set theoretical map from FPE to FP of the pushout uh, graph. And we have a map from FPF uh, into uh, FP of the pushout graph. Okay, this is by functoriality of FP, which we discussed earlier. So, 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 so obviously you have a map from the disjoint union of these two sets. And the only thing that you have to uh, verify is that indeed it is well defined uh, when you when you go to the quotient. But in fact, this is uh, you can play the game of the you know, using the universal property of a push out in the category of sets, blah blah blah, and you can see that this all works and this is a well defined map. Okay. So in order to, 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 to have this, such a natural map, it always exists. I, I didn't use any of these two conditions, okay? All, all that I used was uh, that FP is a functor and, and I used the fact to be proven that indeed uh, I have these canonical graph homomorphisms from uh, graphs into their push up graph. That's all I used. And, and now I, I try to, to write the inverse of this map. Uh, and I realized that without being injective on vertices, 
And without this one color condition, this inverse does not exist. I mean, it's not well defined. But when you have these two conditions given, then indeed you can define the inverse map. And then to check that this is the inverse map is, is a tautology, it's just shifting commas and, and parentheses. Okay. So the whole story is to prove that when you have these two conditions, that the inverse map is well defined. Okay. So that, that part is, I believe, no longer boring. Uh, that's something which came a little bit unexpected uh, to me, and, and, and I like it. And maybe um, I, I want to motivate of why we are doing this. Well, at the end of the day, I want to prove uh, the, the pullback theorem for path algebras. But I want to do it in steps. Uh, first, I want to uh, show for which pushouts FP commutes with pushouts. It's a covariant factor, so, so it should map a pushout to a pushout, and under these conditions, it does. And then I apply this contravariant factor of taking all finally supported maps on the set. And now in full generality, we can prove another lemma that uh, applying this contravariant factor turns pushouts into pullbacks. And then we'll be able, in full generality, so then we'll be able to claim that as long as you have push out of graph homomorphism satisfying these two properties, then when I apply the contravariant factor of taking their path algebras, then it, this push out will be turned into the pullback of graph algebras. This is not graph path algebras, not graph algebras, path algebras, okay? And, and, and that's a very uh, beautiful theorem because it shows when and under which conditions uh, pushouts in the category of graphs turn into pullbacks in the category of path algebras. And this is like a prelude of proving something similar for graph systems algebras. Okay, uh, I think now this is a good time to prove this theorem, uh, sorry, proposition. Uh, Niklas, can you now take over from me and prove proposition 170? Yeah, sure. Uh, I stop sharing and the floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Um, okay. So, can you hear me all right? We can hear you all right. And if, but if, if you could minimize, uh, yes, thank you. <laughs> I just noticed that myself. Yeah. So um, I'm slightly modifying the, the notation to keep track of like the co-domains. So yes. uh, I'm denoting the map from G to E by F E. Yes. And the map from G to F by F F. Surely. And uh, then um, We've just seen how to construct uh, the the pushout graph. Yes, and I've redrawn a part of the diagram here, uh, yeah. so that you see that uh, the source map. I'm doing everything for the source map here because it's the same thing for the target map. Exactly. Yes. Um. So we've seen that the source map uh, was given uh, or obtained from the universal property of mm -hmm. this push out here because we have maps from E1 going via the source to E0 and then via the inclusion to the mm -hmm. push out of sets of E0 and F0. And it's not always an inclusion, but we know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, I call it an inclusion, but... Yes. Between inverted commas, yes, generalizing. Yeah. Um, and similarly, from F1, we go via SF, the source of F to F0. And then we have this map into the push out. And uh, if we go, if we start at G1 and we go via the left side, then it it agrees with going via the right side. Exactly. So thus we obtain from the universal property of this push out, this map from the, the edges of the push out into the vertices of the push out. And this is how we constructed the source map. Exactly. And the universal 
the universal property tells us even more. It mm -hmm. tells us that this map here, mm -hmm. this one we obtained, uh, makes these squares here, this left-hand square and this right-hand square commute. But these are exactly the squares we want to commute in order to have a graph morphism, right? Yes. Because those are the uh, maps into the pushout from E, for example, and the source of E and the source from the pushout. Um, and similarly on the right-hand side here for F. So this is, um, Yeah, I, I, it, it takes a, a little while to think about it, but uh, indeed, I, I, whenever I take any element in this pushout, remember this is a pushout in the category of sets, it's either in the image of uh, IOTA E1 or IOTA F1. And if it is in the image of IOTA F1, then you can uh, write the application of the source map uh, just by the composition of these two arrows. And, uh, but then by the commutativity is the same as the composition of uh, the other two arrows. And yeah. uh, that's precisely what uh, uh, we want to obtain, right? Yeah. That's, that's, uh, that's the commutation uh, that we want to uh, obtain. This is what, what, what makes a, a pair of morphisms, the graph morphism. So, so this proves that IOTA E0 paired with IOTA E1 is really a graph homomorphism, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and like I said, the same uh, thing holds for the target maps. Yeah, the um, only thing which I needed to add is, is that uh, I know that everything in this, if, if it were just an abstract uh, category, uh, I, I wouldn't see it, right? But, but I know that, that here, everything in this, uh, at least I don't know how to do it. I, uh, I, I think, sorry to interrupt you, but I think- No problem. Uh, actually holds abstractly without uh -huh. knowing what the push-up looks like because um, let me okay highlight for example this square here. oh I didn't want yes. to fill it I don't know why <laughs> sometimes computers do what we don't yeah. want them to do. so this is exactly this uh, square we would write down for yep. uh, checking that this is a graph homomorphism, mm -hmm. right? Yes. Just abstractly without knowing what these sets look like. Oh, you're yeah, right. And this Sorry, I take it back, you're absolutely right. Is granted abstractly yes. by this universal property I agree. of push out. I agree, I take back my comment, you're right. Uh, this is uh, unnecessary. I don't need to understand of how this push-out is constructed in a category of sets. Yes, I just want this commutativity, commutativity of the diagram. That's it, sorry. I, I, you're, you're absolutely right. Thank you. So let me maybe... Wow, nice. <laughs> draw it like this. Yep. Okay, so... You know what I mean when I write yes, the pink commute. square and the orange square uh, commute. Um, mm -hmm. This good. means that this uh, IE1, IE0, uh, is a morphism and of course also for F. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of graphs. Yep. All right. Yep. Um, now. So the first part of the proposition is proven. We do have this graph homomorphism. Yeah. Now uh, I've drawn a uh, bigger diagram down here. Mm -hmm. um, so what do we have here? We have the diagram we just had in the lecture in black. Yes, excellent. 
And we now want to check that this construction satisfies the universal property of the pushout. So uh, we assume that we have a graph Q, which also satisfies the universal property. So uh, assume. Yeah, so we have some Q equalities. This is a graph that also satisfies. I mean, we do get, well. Oh, we, we get this maybe, maps J, which equalizes yeah, uh, Fs. Exactly, it's not exactly this thing. Is a graph with maps mm -hmm. as in the commutative diagram. Let me phrase yeah. it like this. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. for now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, so we have maps from E1 and F1 such if we pre-compose with uh, the maps from G1 into them, they mm -hmm. agree. And the same thing for the vertices. Mm -hmm. And um, these maps J are graph morphisms, exactly. which means that, for example, uh, going from E1 via J to Q1 and then via the source map of Q to Q0 mm -hmm. is the same thing as going from E1 via the source map of E to E0 exactly. and then with this J map to Q0. Precisely. Um, and analogously for F. other things we want to commute. So mm -hmm. now um, just... Uh, on the level of sets, um, we know that we have some uh, unique map mm -hmm. here uh, because, well, uh, these uh, these are pushouts in a category of sets. And, yeah, exactly. This vertex set and this edge set are the pushouts in the category of sets. So we get a map of sets a priori, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, which I've drawn in orange and called H here. Um, so these H maps make uh, this triangle commute, this triangle commute. Correct. Um, this triangle commute and yep. this triangle commute. Agreed. Um, so now what is the thing we want to show? The thing we want to show is that H0 and H1 together really constitute a graph morphism. Exactly. That's the only um, thing to check. So let me write down by the universal property um, of push out of sets have uh, maps of sets H0, H1. Those. Uh, are even unique. So um, what we want to check is the commutativity mm -hmm. of the square, which is hidden somewhere here. So if we start um, at the edges yes. of the push out, we can either first go by our map H yeah. to this test object Q yep. as to the edges, and then via its source map to the vertices of Q. Mm -hmm. Or we can go first via the source map of the push out mm -hmm. to the vertices of the push out, mm -hmm. and then by this H map to the vertices of our test object. Exactly. So, uh, Need, oops, that's the wrong pen. 
need to check. The commutativity of this uh, green again filling itself, this green square. Mm -hmm. uh, let me write it down in formulas. Yep. I.e. Um, where do I have my notes? Um, SQ after um, H1 should agree with um, H0 after the source map of the push out, right? Going yep. first via the source map of the push out and agreed and so on. So let me draw again a small portion of mm -hmm. this diagram, which is, uh, well, a little bit uh, clearer, I hope. Yep. Um, so uh, how do I draw this? Let's see. We, we have... So the thing to notice is that both of these maps uh, have the push out of edges as their domain. Correct. Um, so this is E1 push out over G1 with F1. Mm -hmm. So let me write E1 and F1 with mm -hmm. their maps uh, IE1 and whoops, what just happened? Yeah. And F E I F1, sorry, and the edges of G with the maps F, uh, sorry, F F1 and F E one and then we have from E one for example from E one to Q zero we can go in different ways but it will turn out that they actually agree. Mm -hmm. um, so um, let me first maybe write it. Like this, if we assume for a moment that we have this left and right arrow to Q0, mm -hmm. then there exists a unique map. Um, I see how you want to prove it. Beautiful. This push out into Q0. And we now want to show that both the left hand side, this SQ after H0, and the right hand side, H0 after S push out, um, can fill in here and make this diagram commute. But since by the universal property of the push out, there is a unique such map. We know that these two maps have to agree. So that's our strategy here. Perfect. Um, okay, maybe let's write it down. Um, both maps um, can, so how to say that? Uh, I'll satisfy. this arrow here. So I'll just draw this green arrow uh, and I mean this one here, right? Uh, just um, one quick question. Uh, could you please label these uh, top left and right yeah. arrows? Yeah, I'm gonna do this immediately. Mm -hmm. um, uh, 
because um, depending on uh, what, or if we want the left-hand side or the right-hand side for this green thing, we need to choose a priori different uh, maps here on the left or on the right, but it turns out that they agree. So um, how can we go from E1 to Q0? Well, we can either take first the map I called it J. We can first go here via mm -hmm. this J uh, E1. Mm -hmm. and, and then, then use the source map of Q. This is a lot of bookkeeping to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm afraid, but um, okay, let's, okay, we can either go this way, but it turns out that we can also first use the source map of E and then use the JE0 map to go Correct. to Q0. This is just the, the the same thing that J is a graph morphism. Exactly. Um, so I can write it, yes, as equality, beautiful, yes. Mm -hmm. So this is J is zero after uh, the source map of E. Yeah. And on the right hand side, we have the, the another. The same, but with F. Yes, exactly. Yes, so this is just one uh, morphism. Uh, you know, there are no two morphisms depending on what you take for a green arrow, but they have two different presentations which you use. Exactly. Yeah. So um, what we need to check. So first we need to check that, that these two maps in whichever presentation you choose, whether they equalize uh, F1E and F1F. Yeah. So, um, what's the right way to do this? Um, so, mm -hmm. let me go here if we, yes, this yes. way. Um, we can go that way. No, we can go from here to here to here, I guess, right? Yes. <laughs> uh, wait a yeah. second. No, going from Okay, yeah, so by the G1. left band. Yeah, exactly. If we go from G1 via FE1 via JE1 via SQ uh -huh. to E0, then this blue arrow here can be substituted by the combination of uh, this IE1 and this H1. We know that this commutes on the level of sets and yes. this map. But then this uh, IE1 after FE1 agrees with IF1 after FF1, uh -huh. just because this is the push out and yep. these maps are built in this way. But then H1 after IF1 can be replaced by JF1 by the I agree, yes. push out property. So this is the same as going. Yes, I agree, way. yes. So we've seen that going this way, it's the same as going that way. Yeah, this that's correct. Be, um, this first presentation here of these morphisms on the left and right hand side. Uh -huh. So the second one, uh, 
Could you still scroll up? So yeah. the, sec the second, uh-huh. This is F1, F and JF1 and SQ, right? So maybe I'll write it down. So yeah, that would be helpful. SQ after J E one after F one E F one E is now we can replace this J E one map by H one after I E one. And now we have uh, this I E one yes. after F E one, which is this composition, which agrees yep. by with yep. the, the right hand side. Agreed. Right. So this is S Q after H one after I now F one and F F F one exactly. Yes. And now we do this thing backwards and H one after I F one is just j f1 exactly yes which is uh this map yep. on this side with after this bottom map here that's wonderful okay. this is ex exactly uh, so now we can apply the universal property yeah because we the assumption is satisfied apply the universal property mm -hmm. okay by the universal property of this push out. Um, whoa, that was, I, Oops. My, my notepad just crashed. Yeah, my pen crashed on me today. So just, yeah, okay. <laughs> I, I hope it saved at some point. Oof, yes. yeah. Oof. <laughs> That's oh, <everybody>. that was <laughs> this was a big scare. Was a, yeah. So where where was I? By this universal property, we have a unique map. Exactly, the green one. The green one. Um which makes those triangles commute. commute. Yes. Uh Actually, we don't even need that it makes this triangle commute, do we? I think we do, because now we need to check that these two maps, which we want to show are the same, both ah, uh, yes, yes, make yes. these uh, triangles commute. Yes, you are right. Sorry, sorry, absolutely right. Yes, of course. Of course. <laughs> OK. Um, now, let's see. Um, so we need to check that if we pre-compose with IE1, mm -hmm. what happens? Um, so let's say SQ after H1. Yep. After I E1. E1. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's go back to the big diagram. Um, what SQ after H1 after E I1. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes. we want to. Okay, now H1 after e, uh, IE1 is just this uh, blue map JE1, mm -hmm. right? Yes, this is the SQ oh. mean. Yes. JE1. After JE1. Correct. Mm -hmm. So, um, but this is exactly this 
map here on the left hand side as QF to JE1. So we see that this makes yep. this as QF to H1 makes yep. this left hand side commute. Yep. And if we replace E by F, we also obtain uh, that it makes the right hand side commute. Yeah, I agree. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. So this is checked. And now we need so, to... so you proved that this SQ uh, H1 is indeed uh, uh, a green arrow or that exactly. green arrow. Exactly. Now, if you prove that the H0 as uh, disjoint union is also the green arrow, then they must be equal. Because yes. there's only one green arrow. All right. So H0 after S co product. Yeah. Um, after IE1. Exactly. Yeah, that's what we are computing now. Mm -hmm. H0 after S co product mm -hmm. after IE1. Yes, what is it? Okay, let's go back to this big diagram mm -hmm. um, for a second. So H0 after S co product. Mm -hmm. After IE1. After IE1. Yeah. So we know that IE1 uh, is a map of graphs, a graph morphism. Yep. So going uh, as co-product after, no, yeah, after IE1 is the mm -hmm. same as going IE0. As, as, as yes, yeah. that's true. Um, and H0 stays the same. Yep. S E. And I now, agree. And now we see that uh, I E0 and then H0 is because this right hand yep. diagram is a push out, is the same thing as J E0. J -E -zero. Okay, so this is J E0 after S E. Correct. Which was this other presentation of this left hand arrow Bingo. here. So this means that um, H0 after S co-product also is a right is a green arrow. Like we can do the same thing for F. Yeah. So we are done. We're done. Thank you so much, uh, Niklas. Uh, I need uh, your permission now to post uh, the movie, the recording on YouTube, because now you have a second lecture. So yeah. do I have your permission to post it? Yes, of course. Thank you. But I have to ask it explicitly, you yes. know, all these yeah, European Union regulations and so on and so forth. I forgot, you know, we, we are being recorded. But, uh, but, but you did a beautiful job. And in fact, I'm so happy that you did it with a pen because you can you imagine doing these diagrams in LaTeX? This is quite yeah. of a nightmare. Yeah. And, and I'm also very happy because I was afraid that I, I almost stole all the fun from you. But no, I mean, actually the, the, the best part of diagram chasing and this beautiful idea of, of the uniqueness um, give a very cute and yeah. very conceptual proof. That, that's that's is very yeah. nice. So thank you very much. Um, so let's uh, resume at uh, high noon and we'll have only one hour of recitation class today. Okay, so I will give back this 15 minutes later on. I stop recording and we end the lecture for today and see you at noon. Thanks. <laughs>